Ah, you want, is it okay like this? Yeah? Good. Okay, the doors are locked, so I think we can start. Looks like it's time. Okay, so um, today uh, I will discuss something a little bit different, which relates to the introductory lecture, okay, in which I was uh, basically uh, introducing for you both discrete uh, integrable uh, evolution equations on one hand, classical, and on the other hand, quantum integrability in the form of uh, statistical lattice models in two dimensions, generated somehow by some operators, which I call transfer matrices. And so today it will be about this second aspect. And I will try to um, show you actually a sort of saga, okay, which involves various quite different combinatorial objects, which end up, all of them, to be related one way or another uh, via this transfer matrix technique, provided somehow the models I'm constructing under these uh, combinatorial structures are all integrable, okay? So this will be uh, uh, the idea. So along the way, uh, I will ask and answer a few uh, enumerative and also probabilistic questions uh, that you might be interested in, okay? So this is more or less uh, the idea. Now, more precisely, uh, this will be about acronyms. As you can see on this, uh, on this slide, I have uh, put a bunch of acronyms in a yellow background. ASM, 6V, TSSCPP, DPL, FPL, QKZ, and the last acronym is not an acronym, it's an equation. Okay, M squared equals zero. So all these refer and connect to some uh, well-defined uh, and sometimes classical and, uh, and uh, very famous combinatorial problems. And I would say behind all this, there is a combinatorial puzzle that people are still wondering about, which is basically the relation between the first acronym and the third, which is ASM, alternating sign matrices, and TSS-CPP, totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. These are two types of objects which can be enumerated, say for a given size, okay? And the, the remarkable thing is that the cardinalities of those two sets for a given size are the same. Okay, finite sets, same, size, same cardinal, uh, you would expect some bijection to exist there. And to this day, nobody has been able to uh, find any bijection there. Okay, so I'll describe these sets and I'll show you that nevertheless, there is a link between these two sets, which is just more than just enumerating them, but really in their structure, and that this link is provided by some statistical uh, mechanical models that are integrable, okay, and which can be solved by means of uh, this last uh, acronym here, QKZ, the quantum knizhik zamolchikov equation, which I will try to, uh, to explain to you. Okay, so these are, so these two main uh, uh, combinatorial objects, these acronym stands for the intermediate uh, statistical model coming from physics that you use to actually tackle those models. This is the name of the equation that will relate all of these. And now this is just some sort of cherry on the cake. It's the last item in my list. And it has nothing to do at all with the rest, okay? It's just one of those uh, combinatorial wonders that uh, you're doing something here in this corner and suddenly it has to do with something there in this other corner. So here the corner is actually, uh, um, well, the study of algebraic ge uh, varieties, so it's really uh, algebraic geometry, okay? So um, a priori, uh, none of the rest has to do with algebraic geometry, but there is a remarkable link, that is the, these enumerations we are going to, uh, to tackle here, actually also give you uh, solutions to a completely different problem, which is uh, basically uh, evaluating the degree of certain varieties of matrices, matrices again, and here it will be matrices with vanishing squares. OK? 
Okay. All right. So just because this is probably the less known uh, object in this audience, I just want to give you a sort of feeling of, of, of what this is. So, okay, you take a matrix with matrix elements, Mij, okay, you write that the square is zero, okay? So this gives you a bunch of quadratic equations, okay? Now, these quadratic equations form a variety, okay, in the, in the, in, you can consider a vector whose entries are all the matrix elements. Okay, so now you have quadratic relations between these matrix elements. This is a variety. How do you compute the degree of a variety? You intersect it with hyperplanes. So if your uh, dimension is D, you intersect with guys of dimension D minus one, basically the orthogonals of some vectors. Okay, all right. So if you intersect with one, uh, one hyperplane, you still get a variety. Um, it has all chances to still be infinite, you know, have an infinite number of points. So you continue. You take another random hyperplane, and another, and another. And you, ta and you stop, basically, when you only have a finite number of intersections, okay? And then that number is the degree, okay? So this is, uh, I think, a good way of thinking of a degree, and you, you, you will see we can do that on a computer, and we will get degrees as a result, okay? So, all right. So let's go now into the various definitions. Okay, alternating sign matrices. So these uh, came up, actually, in an attempt by uh, these people, Rob Robbins, Ramsey, and Mills, to uh, invent a new notion of determinant, which they called lambda determinant. Okay, so they wanted some, uh, some, uh, some structure, some mathematical structure that would resemble the determinant. So that would be, uh, say, maybe a function of a matrix entries of a given matrix. So you give yourself a matrix and you want to define the lambda determinant as being a sort of maybe polynomial or maybe Laurent polynomial of the entries of that matrix. And they found out that there is a very simple way of doing this, which is deforming the famous um, Lewis Carroll identity, or it's also called the Denano-Jacobi identity. So maybe I should explain about this. So this is uh, summarized in this picture. So, um, okay, so the picture here refers to the following. Whenever I shade something inside us, uh, these are squares, and all these guys are squares. So whenever I shade something inside a square, it means I take the determinant of uh, the matrix entries that are inside that square. So you imagine a, 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 an n by n matrix, okay? And when it's fully shaded, it will be the determinant of a full matrix. Now, if I uh, omit a row and a column, it will be the determinant of a submatrix which misses the first row and misses the first column, etc. Okay? Now, if lambda equals minus one is this identity, this is an identity for any determinant of any matrix, provided, of course, your denominator here doesn't vanish. Okay? So this is called the Lewis Carroll identity because this uh, Dodgson here uh, is actually Sir Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, etc. Uh, but he was also a mathematician and he was. Uh, well, uh, actually using this identity to find a very efficient algorithm for computing determinants, which is called condensation. And it's not just good for computing determinants, but it's also good for proving identities uh, on certain determinants which have particular forms. Okay. So anyway, they wanted to start from this Dodgson identity, which would be with a minus one for the determinant, and then... Uh, well, they just decided to put a lambda here, a parameter lambda. So now instead of calling it a determinant, it's a lambda determinant. And when lambda equals minus one, it reduces to the order ordinary determinant. And here is the definition. So you remove first row and first column, and you take the lambda determinant. You remove nth row and nth column, and you get the lambda determinant, plus lambda. Here is first row, nth column, and no, nth row, first column, first row, nth column. So it corresponds to all these pictures and divided out. And so here you remove both first and last row and first and last column. Okay, so you're only left with an n by minus two by n minus two determinant. Okay, so now you will tell me, okay, fine. Uh, you have to feed this uh, by some initial data, right? Because it reduces basically the t size of a matrix by one or by two. Okay, so it's a free term recursion relation again. 
so you have to say what the determinant of an empty matrix is. It's one, of course, as we all know. And uh, the lambda determinant of a matrix which is one by one is just the matrix entry. Okay, so you have your two initial data and you can uh, un uh, unfold this and you will get uh, what this lambda determinant is. So it has a, a lot of interesting properties. Uh, I have no time to describe them, but there is the main theorem here, which is quite interesting. So as we know, the determinant is a sum over permutations of signature of a permutation times product of uh, matrix elements uh, according to the permutation. Well, you have an analogous formula for the lambda determinant, remarkably. And here it is. First of all, instead of summing over permutations, which you can think in terms of permutation matrices, if you want, that's one way of thinking of permutations, okay? Well, you sum over slightly generalized objects, which are going to be actually coded by alternating sign matrices, okay? So let me show you first what these alternating sign matrices are. So in this case, n, m being n by n, the alternating sign matrices index n means of size n, are n by n matrices, okay? Their matrix elements are all in zero, plus or minus one, okay? And, and the best way of understanding what they are is to think of a C of zeros, okay? So a priori it's full of zeros. And then as you go along each row and each column, you start seeing somewhere a one, then a bunch of zeros, then a minus one, then a bunch of zeros, then a one, etc. Okay, and you end and start always with a one. Okay, it means that the sum along a row is always plus one. And same thing occurs for columns. So the column sums and the row sums are all plus one. So it's like a magic square, right? But only with plus ones, minus ones, and zeros. Okay, there are more of them than permutations because of course the permutations are a particular example of that, right? You go along a row, you get a one and then zeros again. Okay, so that's part of this definition. So it contains permutations, but it's bigger. And in particular, it can have minus ones. So a, a property which I would like you to think about is that whenever you have a minus ones, it's sort of protected. It means that to its right and to its left, there are ones. Okay, and above it and below it, there are ones as well, right? So each minus one is protected somehow from the, from the boundary, okay. All right, so these are these objects. Okay, so now there will be two invariants associated to these alternating sign matrices, I of A, N of A, which I will describe. But first, first of all, I want to uh, show you here where they really occur. They occur as powers of the matrix elements Mij. So you take the product of uh, all the Ij's, right? And you take Mij to the power Aij, and Aij are the matrix elements of these uh, alternating sign matrices. So what does it mean? It means that here, instead of having a polynomial of the entries of a matrix, you have a Laurent polynomial of the entries of a matrix, okay? It's not at all obvious that with a definition like this, you will end up with a Laurent polynomial, right? Because imagine this guy, you have been able to prove it was a Laurent polynomial, these guys also. The next one, for it to be a Laurent polynomial, you need some sort of very non-trivial divisibility property of this polynomial dividing the, the top polynomial here, right? So it should remind you of something. In the first lecture, I talked about cluster algebras, right? Which had these magic properties that anywhere in the cluster tree, I could express my variables in terms of initial variables as Laurent polynomials, okay? Well, uh, this is a ca particular case again of cluster algebra. So that's why uh, the lambda determinant can actually be defined in terms of uh, alternating sign matrices. So yet another example of cluster algebra here. Okay, now I have to describe for you what these two invariants are. So lambda is just the parameter. I of A. So I of A is called the inversion number. So it would correspond to the inversion for ordinary permutations. Okay, it's nice because we know that among those alternating sign matrices, there are the matrices of permutations, okay? So anything we knew already about permutations, we can sort of adapt uh, to, these, uh, to these alternating sign matrices. So I of A is the following. So you look for situations in which you have L less than K and I less than J, and then the two matrix elements, a K, K I, 
an ALJ. So they are like uh, at two opposite corners of a rectangle, like this, okay? And you take those products. So you take the sum over all products of non-zero, non-vanishing matrix elements at, at uh, south, uh, west, and northeast corners of any rectangle inside the matrix, okay? If you do that with a permutation matrix, you get the inversion number, because in, indeed, in, in a permutation, a situation like that corresponds to an inversion. But for alternating sign matrices, you could have signs here, so it's a bit more delicate, but okay, it's this inversion number. So lambda to the power inversion number. And then uh, N of A is much simpler, it's just the number of minus ones, okay? So this you would never have in, a, in an ordinary permutation. And you can check because of this conservation along rows and along columns that the total number of ones is also the total sum of all the matrix entries in absolute value minus n divided by two, okay. So here is, um, okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so just a new definition of determinant, uh, which is, uh, okay. So here is the seven uh, alternating sign matrices of size three by three, okay. So here you see that there is not much space for a minus one, and actually it occurs only in this last matrix, and the minus one is indeed protected on the left and on the right and on top and bottom, right? So this is this example of protection I was telling you about. And all the rest are the six ordinary permutation matrices, okay? So a priori, it starts here. Uh, we have seven instead of six, right? So it's larger than factorial uh, n, but the uh, question is, well, what are those numbers? All right. So... There's a famous theorem which was uh, deemed uh, uh, the alternating sign matrix conjecture and became a theorem, uh, which is the enumeration of uh, alternating sign matrices of size n by n. And it's given by this very nice uh, product formula, okay? So, I don't know, probably some people can immediately think of ways of describing this with uh, various combinatorial objects, okay? Uh, anyway, so this was proved uh, in two very different manners, and actually first by Seilberger and then by Cooperberg, okay? And uh, both proofs, uh, amusingly enough, uh, relate those guys to other objects, actually. So uh, what Seilberger proved is that actually the enumeration of alternating sign matrices, uh, the, the, the work to do to enumerate them is equivalent to the work to do to enumerate the totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions, which we haven't seen yet, okay, but we'll see them very soon. And uh, he has, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Seilberger, but he has all this philosophy of how to prove things using computers or not using computers. And this is a, an A equals B type of proof in his, uh, in his classification. Okay, anyway. The other, uh, and I think perhaps more illuminating proof came after, like in 95, 96, okay, by Cooperberg, who was actually using physics. Okay, so he used uh, uh, a bijection that he found between alternating sign matrices and actually configurations of a statistical lattice model. Okay, and then uh, this is one of the best studied lat statistical lattice models, which is the model of the ice. And therefore, it wasn't very difficult to extract this result from uh, everything that was known about here. Okay. So I would say Cooperberg is really the smart guy because he did hardly any work. He just found the right bijection and then he went to the physics literature and there was this bunch of uh, results known. Whereas Steiberger really like climbed the face north of the mountain and wrote a 120 page paper uh, on the subject, okay? But you have these two proofs which are very nice and uh, in their own way, uh, quite illuminating, but let me go uh, through the Cooperberg approach, which starts with physics, basically. So it starts actually with ice in two dimensions, okay? So ice is made of water, even in this country, I'm sure you see some ice sometimes. So uh, H2O, okay? So the oxygens have a tendency to arrange themselves on a square lattice, on the vertices of a square lattice. And the hydrogens, well, they form uh, 
uh, bonds with ions, okay? You have H plus ions and O2 minus ions, okay? And they form bonds, so two H's have a tendency to be close to an oxygen, okay? And for some reason, uh, they, you know, for electrostatic reasons, they have a tendency of being along edges, okay? So here I haven't written the edges, but imagine some material edges connecting two uh, neighboring oxygens, okay? And there's always an H along that edge, but the edge has a tendency to be closer to one of the two oxygens, okay? So now if there's a way of coding this, which is with, with arrows here, so the arrow is basically, uh, let's see, pointing, let's take the first one, it's pointing for the, from the distance hydrogen to, the, to the, the, the oxygen it is on the edge of, right? So it points like this. This points away like uh, the hydrogen is closer to the oxygen, okay? So, of course, coding this situation with arrows, you see immediately that you have a rule here, which is that at each vertex, you must have the same number of entering arrows as you have of outgoing arrows, okay? So this is a conservation law, and it is called the ice rule, for obvious reasons, okay? So this is a, a model of edge configurations. Uh, the edge configurations are just orientations, and they are such that at each vertex, uh, there are exactly two entering and two outgoing edges. Okay, this is called the six vertex model. So you can consider it in uh, various, uh, with various boundary conditions. But now, for this particular purpose of studying alternating sign matrices, you have to look at them with very specific boundary conditions, which are called uh, domain wall boundary conditions. Okay, so domain wall, why? Why is it called domain wall? Well, these are boundary conditions that force a front uh, between arrows uh, pointing in one direction and arrows pointing in the other direction. So, you see, horizontally, everything enters on the left and enters on the right. It means that somewhere in the middle, there will be uh, two competing arrows, right? An arrow coming from the left and one coming from the right, okay? So it forces domain wall existence inside this, uh, this, uh, this configuration, okay? Same thing here, now you have all the outgoing arrows uh, on top and on bottom. So this is a square, okay? So you have as many uh, horizontal uh, entering arrows at vertical outgoing arrows, which is good. Uh, we need uh, as many entering as outgoing uh, with this uh, ice rule. And now, there is a bijection between uh, these configurations here and those configurations there. Okay, now why is it called six vertex model? I uh, represent it for you on the blackboard. The six possibilities for four arrows around the vertex, such that there would be exactly two entering and two outgoing. Okay, so uh, traditionally these are called A, B, and C, uh, just uh, according to uh, the orientations here, uh, the same name holds for an orientation it's opposite. Okay, so here these two are related by just reflecting all arrows, these two also and these two also. Okay, now how does it go? How does the, the bijection go here? It's very simple. You have uh, transmitting vertices and reflecting vertices, okay? So by transmitting vertex, I mean A or B. So you see whenever a narrow enters, it comes out pointing in the same direction. It's like it goes straight. It doesn't see the vertex somehow, right? Whereas C is, is, uh, is reflecting because uh, any arrow that enters is reflected, okay? So now if you look carefully here, let's take, uh, okay, let's take the first, this column here, okay? So it starts with, uh, okay, let's, let's start from the bottom, okay? So the bottom is here. You see this is a transmitting vertex. This is another transmitting vertex. So we have two transmitting vertices. So first rule is that any transmitting vertex will correspond to zero, okay? So A's and B's give zeros. And then after these two transmitting verte vertices, I have a C-type vertex here, which is actually of a second kind. Okay, so maybe I should call it C2. This would be C, C2 and C1. Okay. So the C2s are going to correspond to the 1s. Okay, so there is a C2 here. You can see it right here. And this is a 1. 
Okay, let's pick a one randomly elsewhere in this corner, for instance. Okay, so in this corner, what you see is a C2 again. Okay, so the ones correspond to C2, and the minus ones are going to correspond to C1. So let's see a minus one here. It's third from uh, uh, the bottom and from, uh, okay, so third is here, and here you can see that we have a C1. Okay? All right, so this is how the bijection goes. Okay? You just code the, the, the configurations of your six vertex model by plus ones, minus ones, or zeros. And then you will check easily that my uh, defining uh, conditions for the alternating sign matrices are actually equivalent to the ice rule here huh? with these particular boundary conditions. Okay, so there is this uh, uh, very useful bijection. So now let's look more closely at this six vertex model with domain wall boundary conditions. So here are the six vertices uh, depicted again. All right, so now the, the, the full model, if you want, has um, weights attached to each configuration of each vertex, uh, each of these six configurations, which depend on various parameters. So first there is a parameter Q here, which appears here and here, okay? So Q is a sort of a landmark of a model, if you want. It's a bit like the kappa in the, in the SLE. So it's, it's, it tells you which model you're looking at, basically. So there's this Q, a complex number, non-vanishing, if you want. And then there's these and W. So these and W's are, uh, are, uh, have a, a, a different... Uh, physical interpretation, they're called spectral parameters. So the Z's and W's, you, you want to view them as being carried by horizontal and vertical uh, lines inside my configuration, okay? And I can take uh, any, any, any I like. So for instance, in, in, in this place, I will have different values of Z's for the various vertical lines in my, uh, in my configuration, okay? So these are, there are many more of these parameters. There are 2n of them because there are n horizontal lines and n vertical lines in my uh, configurations. And at each intersection between a line carrying z and a line carrying w, there will be these weights depending on z and w in this way. Okay, so these are uh, just homogeneous of degree 1 if you want. They're chosen in that way, but it's always up to normalization. Okay, now this model here with these particular weights is integrable. So remember my, my definition of integrability, it had to do with the existence of an infinite number of commuting transfer matrices, okay? So there is a way of actually coding all this information, which is called the R operator. So it's kind of useful to have this, uh, this thing in mind. All right, so everything is now acting on a vector space, which is basically C2, and which has two distinguished basis vectors corresponding to the two possible orientations of the arrows. So strictly speaking, you have uh, horizontal vector spaces with horizontal values of the arrows. I should have represented them under. Yeah, let me do it. After all, I have this uh, beautiful machine. Why not use it? Uh, so the other would be something like this. So you have horizontal vector spaces, which are indexed, uh, which are two-dimensional vector spaces indexed, so with distinguished bases indexed by these two possible uh, orientations of the arrows and vertical vector spaces uh, indexed uh, with a distinguished basis indexed by these two possible values. So it's a, just a way of saying that if I pick a, a given orientation, it's like picking a vector in my vector space. Okay? So nothing else. So now, of course, you can view this list of numbers as the entries of a matrix acting uh, between the tensor product of, uh, so, okay, you want to view these two as the starting spaces and these two as the ending spaces. So it goes from V1 tensor V2 to V2 tensor V1. So a priori, we're going to have a 4 by 4 matrix, okay, whose indices are just pairs of configurations of arrows. So there are four pairs of configurations of arrows on this tensor product here, and four pairs here. So it's a four by four matrix. And I just fill it with those numbers and with zeros whenever there is no, uh, no connection. So let's say, for instance, the, uh, the vector, so the first vector in V1 space tensor the second vector in the V2 space, okay, will be connected to the uh, 
second vector in the V2 space, tensor, the first vector in the V1 space, and the matrix element corresponding to this connection will be this B. Okay? So that's another way of coding uh, matrix elements. And now there's a, by use of those operators acting on those tensor products of, sp of vector spaces, uh, you can define a transfer operator, so of which, of course, uh, the transfer matrix will be made uh, of, of the matrix elements of that operator in the distinguished basis uh, of the tensor product of the corresponding spaces, okay? Just a product of these R operators uh, along, a, along a certain line, okay? And then uh, you have to fix the vector in the horizontal space here and fix the vector in the horizontal space there so that they reproduce by boundary condition that they have entering arrows horizontally uh, on the right and on the left, okay? So something like the uh, matrix element corresponding to uh, these two uh, choices of indices on the left and on the right, okay? Now, here you can see that I have picked different values of the spectral parameters, Z1, Z2, up to Zn. So a priori, I get something quite complicated. It will be a function of a s horizontal spectral parameter T and the vertical sp spectral parameter Z1, Z2, Zn. And you see that the matrix elements here are just polynomials right, because they are products of bunches of those, of those matrix elements, okay, so polynomials of T and of the Z's, okay. So this is my transfer matrix. Why is this thing integrable? Because the R matrix satisfies a local uh, relation, which is called the Young-Baxter equation, which guarantees the commutation of the transfer matrices. All right, so this is a, a very standard uh, kind of uh, uh, exercise here to show that two transfer matrices, a product of two transfer matrices actually commute if the R operators which I defined before satisfy a certain local relation, okay, but I just want to uh, sort of, okay, show you what this is all about. Okay, so the representation of the R matrix is really like a cross, okay, like in my tetravalent maps, okay, so the cross is really the R matrix operator, and you, you really want to view it as acting from a tensor product of spaces to another tensor product of spaces. Now, the colors here correspond to the spaces, so that you can follow the spaces around, okay? So here, for instance, uh, so depending on uh, in which direction I, I view the thing, let's say I go from left to right, so I act on V1 tensor V2 by an R matrix, which I call R12, and then the result is in V2 tensor V1, tensor V3. Actually, I was starting from V1 tensor V2 tensor V3. I didn't do anything to V3. I acted on 1, 2. So that's this R1, 2. So if you want, it's really the R acting on these two spaces and acting as the identity on the third space, on the tensor product of the three. And at the end of the day, I will map V1 tensor V2 tensor V3 to V3 tensor V2 tensor V1. I reflect. Uh, the order of my vector spaces, okay? And to do that, I need to do three actions. So one, two, one, three, two, three, as you can see here. And now you think of these lines which carry the, the, the vector spaces as, as uh, sticks in a Mikado game. Uh, I hope you all know the Mikado game, okay? So think that the red stick is on top, okay? So you want to actually push the red stick across this intersection, right? So you push it and it goes to the other side, okay? So this is the other picture, which has to be equivalent to the first picture, but this equivalence means there must be a, an identity between products of operators on both sides, and this is the other identity, so you just read everything again. So you start from V1 tensor V2 tensor V3, then you have this action of R2 free, okay, which interchanges the two spaces 2 and 3, then you have an action of 1 free, and then of 1 2, finally. Ah, so this is this right-hand side. Okay, so this identity here looks like nothing, but wh what it really means is that, again, I can replace calculations by pictures, and whenever I have a situation where I have a triangle which looks like the left-hand side of my Mikado, it means that I can take one of, uh, of the links above the intersection to the other side, okay? This is really what it means. So now, let's see. I have two transfer matrices, one at t and one at t prime, so these are two consecutive rows in my configuration. So the, the, the values of, um, 
of the configuration, or if you want, the one picks a particular vector in each of the two horizontal vector spaces on the right and on the left, and in the, in the middle is just operators, okay? So let's say now that I act with an R operator from the left, okay? So an R operator which uh, basically uh, involves these two vector spaces, okay? Now, because the arrows here are already pointing to the right, and because I know that there is this ice rule, I know also that there is only one non-vanishing matrix element uh, corresponding to these, to, to these two exiting arrows. I must have two entering arrows. Otherwise, I get zero because I had this ice rule which told me as many entering arrows as outgoing arrows. So actually, the operator itself reduces to just one matrix element, okay? So basically, the action of the operator on this product of, uh, of operators is just multiplication by a number, which is this A uh, vertex here, and T and T prime are just the two horizontal spectral parameters here. Okay, so A T of T, T of T prime is equal to what? Well, now I'm using this, uh, this magic trick of pushing the, the, the red line across the intersection. This is my red line, I push it across the intersection. So midway, I have something like this. And I continue, so it's like a zipper, Okay? Now, as the zipper advances, the magic thing is that T and T prime get permuted. Okay? Just because of this crossing here, and the, I recall that the spaces go straight, right? The, the spaces go straight across the intersection, so the, the, the space carrying T goes straight and ends up on top, and that carrying T prime ends up on the bottom. So I end up with basically T of T prime, T of T, and then again, a matrix element of the same operator, and I find out that this is just the reflected one. Okay, one was the A, and the other one is the reflected one, so they have the same value, so I can just eliminate, and I find that the two products commute. Okay, so now I can show you uh, a consequence of this integrability. So let's consider now the partition function of a six vertex model with domain wall boundary condition on a grid n by n, okay, with horizontal parameters z1, z2, zn, and vertical parameters w1, w2, wn, okay? So what is this partition function? There will be a particular normalization, which is just a technicality. You don't need uh, to, to worry about that. But so what is it? You sum over all configurations of arrows on the grid, Okay? And for each of those configurations with the ice rule satisfied, of course, you're going to take the product of the inner vertices here, i and j, of all the weights corresponding to the zi wj intersection. Okay? So everything inside, take the big product of that. And the normalization is just you divide the c of zi wi product over all elements. Well, basically, because uh, there is at least a one per row and per column, so uh, it's like there's a C per row and per column, and so you divide by this C, okay. Now, theorem, very interesting theorem, uh, which is that Zn thus defined is a polynomial of the Zs and Ws, and it's also a Laurent polynomial of Q, but okay, more interestingly, it's a polynomial of the Zs and Ws, and it's actually given by this product times the determinant, okay? All right, so A and B are just these weights, A and B, but they had particular uh, formulas. Well, I don't want to repeat them, but it was just two uh, degree one polynomials in Z and W, okay? So these are like uh, monomials, if you want. Huh? These are the van der Mond determinants that we have uh, encountered before already, and this is now the determinant of one over A Z I W J B Z I W J. Okay. Now, why is this thing a polynomial? It's, it's not completely obvious already. Well, you see that the denominators in the determinant, they are all going to be cancelled by this product here. Okay, so that's pretty good. Okay. But now I have divided out by all these van der Mond determinants. So I better make sure that these van der Mond determinants divide out this determinant. Okay. It is true because uh, you see, let's take just one i and one j, okay? Z i and w j are, are labels per row and per column, okay? So if two of the z's are equal, it means that in this big determinant, two of the rows are equal, okay? So a determinant with two rows equal must vanish. 
Therefore, it's divisible, actually, by zi minus zj. Okay? So this divisibility here is actually granted by the, simply by the properties of a determinant. Okay, so this formula is due to a, well, uh, not together, but uh, to Isergin and Korepin. It's called the isergin korepin determinant. Okay? And the way to prove this determinant formula, uh, you, you basically use two things. You use explicitly the integrability uh, that tells you that basically this quantity should be symmetric in the permutation of the z's and symmetric in the permutation of the w's. That's one thing. And second thing, you find a very simple recursion relation by discussing uh, on the vanishing of a top corner, which immediately uh, projects you on a, on, on a grid of size one less. Okay, so there's a recursion relation plus uh, symmetries, which allow to prove this uh, nice theorem. Okay, so this is all for a six vertex model. If you have any questions, okay. Now, another guy in my list. The totally symmetric self-complementary <coughs> plane partition. Okay, so let's let's talk about plane partitions first. What is a plane partition? Well, first of all, what is a partition? You all know uh, what partitions are. Huh? These are ways of writing an integer as a sum of integers. Okay, so there are various ways of representing it, but this is the, called the Russian representation, in which uh, you put your young diagram in a corner. Okay, so basically you have. Uh, uh, the condition that the number of boxes in each row uh, cannot exceed the number of boxes in the next row. Okay? All right? So these are 2D partitions. Now there's a three dimensional version of 2D partitions, which is just uh, uh, you imagine that some, some child is playing with cubes, okay, and piling them up in the corner, in a corner of the room, okay? And then that again, there is a condition that the, here I wrote the gravity uh, being in the minus one one direction in this, uh, in this space. And here we have a gravity in the minus one 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 direction in our space. That is the, the cubes are attracted to the corner. Okay? So for a cube to rest somewhere, he must have uh, basically three, uh, three corners, uh, a full corner under it. Okay? All right. So these are plane partitions. Okay. Now, you can view a plane partition here in, uh, in perspective as actually a rhombus tiling of an hexagon. Okay? And you see uh, the, the map is simple. You, you get color blind. You remove the colors. And then what you see here is a rhombus tiling. Uh, there are three rhombi again, uh, which are these, uh, these three uh, around uh, this hexagon here. Okay, so one rhombus is the top of a, of a, of a cube, and, and the two other is the left and right uh, sides of a cube uh, viewed in, uh, in perspective, but uh, that's what it is. So any rhombus tiling gives rise to a plane partition and vice versa. So you, you want to tile a sufficiently large hexagon, basically, that it contains uh, your entire configuration of, uh, of cubes. All right. So then uh, TSS-CPP is just a particular type of plane partitions, okay? These are plane partitions with symmetries. Okay, so actually the acronym in here stands for, uh, for the symmetries. So TS totally symmetric, SC self-complementary, PP plane partition. Okay, totally symmetric self-complementary means what? Means that this rhombus tiling has all possible symmetries of the regular hexagon, so it's an hexagon now 2n by 2n by 2n, okay? And it has all possible symmetries of uh, 2n by 2n by 2n hexagon, so you have rotational, uh, um, uh, flips, etc. Huh? So you see here, for instance, there's a, a row of fixed ties, the blue ties are fixed here, and there's a flip uh, symmetry. Along this line, and there, there's more, there's a rotational symmetry by 2 pi over 3, etc. So, here, what I have represented is a fundamental domain under all these symmetries, and it's basically 1 12 of the hexagon. Okay? So, if you want to enumerate uh, these uh, configurations of, of tilings uh, within a, a, an hexagon of size 2n, 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 well, you have to enumerate configurations of tiling of this uh, fundamental domain. 
Now, this fundamental domain has some peculiarities. It has some fixed boundaries, like this straight line and this wiggly line, OK? And it has movable boundaries, which, uh, which is this line here. As you can see, there are some, uh, some uh, tiles popping out in various places. Actually, the number of tiles popping out is fixed. It's related to the size, OK? But the positions of these tiles popping out is, are not fixed, OK? So what he, this whole thing amongst two is to actually enumerate what are called non-intersecting lattice paths, which are basically following along, uh, along broken lines like this, the tiles of yellow and pink type, OK? You just forget completely about the blue tiles, OK? And you just concentrate on the, uh, on the yellow and, and, and pink tiles. And then they, they form successions like this, which you can represent as broken lines, OK? And those broken lines are actually paths on a, on a lattice, OK? There's a, an implicit lattice uh, under this picture on which these are non-intersecting paths. The number of paths is just the number of points of green points here, which has to do with the size, OK? And basically, enumerating those objects boils down to enumerating non-intersecting lattice paths, OK? So the theorem is here now. So it takes back to Andrews, but there is a very much simplified proof by Kratenthaler, which uh, is really uh, useful to look at, which is that the total number of TSS CPPs in a 2n by 2n by 2n hexagon is the same number, OK? So this very same number as the number of alternating sign matrices. So this is the puzzle. Why at all would these two objects have anything to do with one another? OK. I recall something I told you, I think, in the first lecture, which was that the rhombus tiling model itself is integrable, OK? So that might be a, a hint as to how to connect the two problems, OK? And it's not just integrable. It's actually a five-vertex model that you can view as a particular case of six-vertex model. So that I didn't show last time. But uh, it's kind of obvious here that uh, locally, if you again uh, straighten up a bit the ties like I did last time. Probably here I straighten them up uh, in the other way, so you have to be careful. Um, you can see either of these five pictures whenever you look at a square in a configuration. Okay? So you have uh, only these five possibilities. Now there's a mapping between these configurations and configurations of a six vertex model by just putting an arrow pointing to the right whenever you have an occupied vertical edge. So when it's empty, it points to the left, as you can see here. Here it's occupied again, it points to the right. So, so much for the horizontal edges. And for the vertical edges, let's say, uh, whenever an horizontal edge here is occupied, the vertical, the dual vertical uh, edge here points down. OK, so down when occupied, up when empty. OK, so you see here you have a perfect uh, uh, connection between those five pictures and those five vertices. And what you can see is that there are only five of the six. So one B is missing. Okay? But it looks really very much like the same kind of model, physically speaking. Okay? So I'll try to push this uh, connection a bit further. Here is a remark uh, which might interest you because it makes a connection with the other talks. Quite, uh, quite remarkable. So imagine I want to uh, enumerate not totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions, but just plane partitions. I would uh, uh, have an hexagonal uh, situation like this. And, and, and let's say we start from, uh, from a corner of the hexagon, from two corners of the hexagon. So let's say my hexagon has n times k times n as a, a size, OK? And now, again, enumerating the configurations of tilings of this hexagon just amount to enumerating lattice paths, OK, which starts on these edges along the k, length k edge of my hexagon and end up on the middle line in the middle of my, uh, my hexagon here at certain positions, which I call m1, m2, m3, etc. And there are k positions. If the size here was k, there are k exiting positions there, OK? So there is actually 
uh, a theorem that you can prove very easily uh, by means of a so-called gessel vienno uh, uh, approach to enumeration of non-intersecting lattice paths. There is actually a formula for the total number of non-intersecting lattice paths in this geometry, which end at specified values m1, m2, m3 along this, uh, this line. Okay? And it's given by a determinant, like this. So you can work out then the determinant, and you see that this determinant factors out a van der Mond determinant of the positions. Okay? So what is this telling you? It's telling you that, again, uh, these paths that don't intersect okay, are, act like fermions. Right? They don't like to, uh, to have uh, their endpoints at the same place. Okay? So it's again a van der Mond here. And then here a bunch of factorials. But now I ask you to think if you wanted to enumerate now um, uh, the tiling configurations of a full hexagon, let's say with k, n, n, k, n, n here, uh, sizes, then you would have to do this on both sides. Right? So basically what you get is you enumerate the configuration on the left times the total number of configurations on the right, right? Provided they have the same endpoints, m1, m2, m3, m6. So basically, it's the square of this quantity, which will be your number, total number of non-intersecting lattice paths. OK? Van der Mond square times something you get out of this product of a bunch of factorials. Imagine now you're starting to look at this from very far away and taking very large sizes and trying to do scaling. Well, uh, you're going to use as much as you can uh, what you know about factorial, which is basically the Stirling formula. And you will be able to express all these guys as the exponential of something, which you want to call, again, a potential. And this is exactly the kind of distribution we were looking at in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix models. Okay? So my point here is to tell you that there is a very uh, amusing analogy uh, between uh, what happened in the matrix models and what happens in the enumeration of those, of those objects, okay, of those plane partitions. Okay, so I won't uh, comment any further on that, but I wanted to uh, make this uh, connection. All right, so let's go to another acronym now, unless there are some uh, questions. Okay, bon. another acronym. Densely packed loop model, DPL. So anything I write in, 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 in green here are just the, the names of major people having worked uh, in, in, in those models, right? Including uh, involved in their definition and their solutions. So Ninois in this case. All right, so the geometry we're looking at now is not a square, but it's a semi-infinite cylinder of square lattice. So you imagine you have a, a square lattice and you wrap it around the cylinder, and now the cylinder has a boundary and it goes to infinity on the other side, okay? Now, I have a square lattice uh, drawn on this. I, on each face, I draw either of these two pictures with probabilities p and 1 minus p, okay? p is strictly between 0 and 1, of course. So that would be the homogeneous model when I take the same p for everybody. And pi and 1 minus pi, that would be the inhomogeneous model. So these are two different models, basically, but I introduce them at the same time. And the i just correspond to uh, the label of a boundary point over which, above which, you're going to uh, take your, your, your two faces with probabilities pi and 1 minus pi. So for instance, above a point 3 here, right, in this face, I will draw the first picture with probability p3 and the second with probability 1 minus p3, okay? p depends on the position, the vertical position, where you are. Okay, so the question is, now that I have drawn all these guys uh, with those probabilities, uh, what is the probability of connecting the boundary point in a certain way? Okay, so let me be more specific. So this is one of those configurations here, okay? So you see that those uh, little tiles, once put together, they, they draw loops, of course. Okay? And those loops are dense because they pass everywhere. Okay? So that's why it's called dense loop model. But now the more interesting question is that if I take a, a boundary point here, well, actually what you can prove is that, uh, like you say, almost surely, uh, this, uh, this piece of, of curve is going to come back to the boundary somewhere. Okay? So, Hence the question, give yourself a, a pairing of the boundary points, 
Okay? That pairing, of course, is non-crossing. Uh, it's planar because we know that there is no way of crossing here by definition of a model. So give yourself a certain pattern here. I call it a link pattern of two endpoints along, uh, around the circle via uh, chords, basically. Uh, then what is the probability of actually uh, connecting the points in this picture according to that given uh, pattern of connection? Okay. All right. So the set of link patterns we call LPN, LP like link patterns. Now here is the answer. I'm giving you first the answer. Okay. So I'm going back to my six vertex model and my alternating sign matrices. Okay. There's yet another bijection. I know this is a lot of bijection, but I'm sorry. This is bijection day. So um, there is yet another bijection between alternating sign matrices and so-called fully packed loop configurations. Okay. <laughs> fully packed is not the same as densely packed. Uh, well, first of all, you see that my loops here are not wiggly. Okay. There are no, no, nothing turns around. They are just making nice straight angles. Okay. And they're connecting every other boundary edge. Okay. So you, you have again an N by N grid. Okay. With edges sticking out on the boundary and every other one is painted in red. Okay. And then the rule inside is that at each, every vertex, you have uh, uh, two edges, incident edges that are painted in red, and two which are empty, okay, painted in white, if you want. So around this vertex here, you have the two guys here painted in red, and the two guys here which are empty, okay? So this is the definition of a fully packed loop model configurations, okay? And now there's a bijection between the configurations here and the configurations of alternating sign matrices. All right, so just to make a long story short, whenever you have a zero, you must turn at a corner, okay? So all the corners correspond to zeros, okay? Whenever you have a one or a minus one, you go straight, okay? So all the, all the straight uh, portions here are ones and minus ones, okay? And then you have to piece up things together and I will let you do it as an exercise, okay? So there's again a bijection between fully packed loop configurations on the square grid and alternating sign matrices. Therefore, also with six vertex model configurations with uh, uh, domain wall boundary conditions. But now, here is the interesting thing. A priori, I was staring stupidly at my alternating sign matrices and I had nothing clever to say. But now, when I st stare at an alternating sign matrix, I can tell immediately to which link pattern it is going to correspond, right? Because it connects the outer points, which I label 1, 2, 3, up to 12 in this case, in a certain pattern, right? 1 connected to 2, 3 to 4, 5 to 12, 6 to 7, 8 to 9, 10 to 11. So in other words, I have an observable on my configurations here, which is just how the guys are connected, okay? So I can define FPL of pi, pi being a link pattern, okay, of these two endpoints around the, the circle, which is the number of configurations, or if you want, of alternating sign matrices, which realize this connection between the boundary points, okay? This is an integer, okay? Integer, number of configurations for each fixed value of pi, okay? Well, the thing is that this gives the solution to the other problem. So uh, it is now a theorem. It has remained a conjecture for a long time, you see, due to Razumov and Stroganov in 2001, and was just proved uh, this, uh, this spring by Cantini and Sportiello. So the, the solution to the other problem is that the probability to reach a certain connection pi divided, normalized by the probability to reach the connection pi zero, which is written up here. Okay, so pi zero just means that you have these uh, straight connections of i and n minus i around my cylinder. Okay, so you have this fancy normalization of a probability, which gives you exactly these numbers of configurations. Okay, so first of all, you see you have a ratio of probability here. It's a number, it's an integer. Okay. So that's something not completely obvious. Well, what you could expect is that the probability itself was a rational number, but that this ratio here would be an integer is non-trivial. But even more non-trivial, that the second problem would be the solution to the first, yes. Is the probability under dense 
Yeah, yeah. So on the left, yeah. So on the left hand side, this is the dense loop configurations on the semi infinite cylinder, okay, with these probabilities and everything. On the right hand side, this is just the counting on the finite square grid of, uh, of, of the configurations that realize the link pattern. So two very different models, right? Not even the same kind of geometry. Geometry is infinite here, geometry is finite here, right? So it's very, very bizarre connection, but it's been proved uh, in a purely combinatorial way uh, by Cantini and Sportiello. So there were uh, other uh, uh, results that had been derived uh, before uh, using integrability, actually. So I, I was part of some of these uh, efforts. And uh, in particular, um, there is a question of a sum rule. You see, if you sum over all possible uh, connect patterns of connections, of course you're going to have all the possible configurations of alternating sign matrices. So that's this AN number. So there was a question already non-trivial that the normalization of those probabilities would be given by AN, okay? And that was the, another conjecture which had been proved by uh, use of integrability. So I want to just uh, show you quickly while why the densely packed loop model is integrable and how to use its integrability to say anything about it. Okay, so again, we have an R matrix. I don't have to repeat, it's the same uh, spirit as before. The R matrix is now going to act on the link patterns, which I represent instead of inside a circle, inside of a rectangle, because just a rectangle is simpler to draw than a circle, okay? So, but imagine this is a circle, okay? So we're, we're just having an operator acting on the link patterns via a crossing of, uh, of, 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 of vector spaces, if you want. So here, just represented by this cross. And it acts via these two uh, possible configurations with these two possible uh, probabilities, right? So the probability is the matrix element, okay? The transition uh, uh, matrix element, if you want. And uh, the picture is the actual operator. Okay, so here it's clear how it goes. Either you act with two parallel lines or you act with some uh, little uh, uh, thing like this, okay? So the first operator I call identity because it doesn't modify the structure of the connection, but the second operator modifies the structure of the connection because it's going to create a connection between these two points. So I call it EI, right? So the action of this R operator on the link patterns is just PI, my probability, times the action of the identity, so it doesn't change the initial guy, plus one minus PI times EI, which changes the connection, okay? All right, so these operators, EI, are very interesting. They are called uh, the generators of the temporally lib algebra, okay? And they satisfy some uh, free term relations. So I think it's worth uh, see, seeing that relation once. So this is EI. EI acts between the point I and the point I plus one. Then I act with EI plus one, between I plus one and I plus two. And then I act with I again. Okay, so this is EI, EI plus one, EI. And the claim here is that these operators combine to just give you EI. So think of it just a little bit. If you pull these two strings here, okay, you end up with just the two first guy and a vertical line like this. So this is the pictorial explanation of this uh, algebra relation between these, uh, these operators. And then there's the other equation, which is that EI is a projector. EI squared is EI. So if you do EI and then EI again, what you do is create a loop, okay? And we put no weight to the loops, weight one to the loops. So we can just erase the loops. And that's EI squared equals EI, okay? So we have this algebra. And precisely as a consequence of EIs satisfying this algebra, one can find uh, 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 parameterizations of these two probab uh, of this probability, PI basically, that makes the model integrable. So here is the solution. Okay, it's a bit uh, technical, but here is the solution. Again, it's going to depend on two spectral parameters, an horizontal and a vertical one, and provided you have uh, your probability uh, uh, parameterized in this way, uh, you will have an integrable model. Okay, so now you form the vector 
uh, whose entries are the probabilities you're after, okay? So basically, each pi will be the index of, uh, uh, of a, uh, it's a basis. The basis is indexed by the pi. So each basis uh, vector, uh, you will put as a component the ratio of probabilities, okay? So you call psi this vector, or psi pi, the, the entry of that vector, okay? Then the, 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 the fundamental formula is that the transfer matrix of the model acting on psi is equal to psi. That is, psi is the vector of, of of probabilities left invariant by the action of this uh, transfer matrix operator. And what this transfer matrix operator does is add up one row of squares to my situation. But you see, uh, I have an infinite, I already have an infinite semi-infinite cylinder, right? And I'm adding up to the boundary one row of squares, okay? And the idea that by doing that, I don't change the probabilities. Okay, this is just what this equation is telling you. Invariance under ad enhancement of this infinite semi-infinite semi cylinder. Okay, so that determines psi, actually, as the peron frobenius eigenvector of this uh, operator here, T, which is just a product of a bunch of those R operators, which are all rational fractions of the T's and the Z's, okay? And this psi can be actually chosen to be a polynomial of the Z's, and is, that's another very important point, independent of T. Because the, the transfer matrix is here because of integrability, commute at various T's, right? I have a commuting family. Therefore, the eigenvector doesn't depend on this parameter. So I just have a polynomial of the Z's. So you see, my, my solution here for those probabilities is just a polynomial of the Z's, Z's being used to parameterize the probabilities in the first place, okay? So this is how it works. All right, so the quantum Tijnik Zamochikov equation, which is really the crucial point here, so that's why I want to, uh, to zoom in on it, is just a consequence of a young Baxter equation. You remember the Mikado move, okay? So here is my transfer matrix, right? It's a product of a bunch of R operators with vertical, uh, uh, various different vertical uh, values of these spectral parameters. And uh, the Mikado move tells me that if I act with R on one side and have ZI and ZI plus one in a certain order, it's the same as acting with R on the other side, but with ZI and ZI plus one permuted, right? Because the action, the, the, the Mikado move permutes the two positions of ZI and ZI plus one, okay? So this is called an intertwining relation for the transfer matrix, okay? And from the intertwining relation for the transfer matrix, you can deduce a relation for the peron frobenius eigenvector of eigenvalue 1, which is just that the transposition, the permutation of ZI and ZI plus 1 in this polynomial of the Z's is induced by the action of the R matrix on the initial poly, uh, polynomial of the Z's, right? So you have uh, an operator acting on a vector here gives you the vector in which the spectral parameters have been permuted, okay? So this looks like nothing, but this is a very important uh, relation which has occurred in many uh, different contexts. So one of which, this is not the same Smirnov, this is our Smirnov, uh, Fedor, Fedor Smirnov, <laughs> uh, Frankel Reshetikin and Jimbo Miwa, so in three different, completely different uh, uh, works. Uh, so one of them having to do with quantum group representation, one of them having to do with uh, bootstrap equations for uh, um, uh, diffusion, basically. And, uh, okay, these two with uh, quantum groups, actually. Okay, and so now I want to show you how to actually use this equation. So this equation really translates in components into very specific properties for the components, which allow to compute them completely. So, uh, depending on whether, okay, this is a bit technical. I don't know if I want to spend time. Well, trust me here that there are properties that you can just deduce from this equation here that allow to compute psi completely, okay? And let me just show you the solution. So, here is the solution. You first... Uh, have to determine the uh, entry of this vector that corresponds to pi zero. And pi zero, I recall, was the pattern of connection with all straight lines, 
Okay? So this is completely determined by the, by the equation I wrote before. Okay? So you get actually a Q-deformed van der Monde. It's again a sort of square van der Monde determinant, if you want, but now Q-deformed. Okay? So it's no longer fermions, really, but the quantum fermions, you would call them. I don't fermions up to shifts. But it's, you don't, it's not just that you don't like to be at the same place as your neighbor, but you, you don't like to be at, the, at a place shifted with respect to your neighbor, okay? something like this. Okay? And then the rest of the probabilities is determined by a triangular system in terms of this initial probability. So you have a, a well-defined way of computing all those probabilities as solutions of this QKZ equation. So here is now the, the, the theorem, which really is the important thing, which is that the sum of those probabilities that were not normalized directly, huh, that were um, actually normalized in such a way that they would be polynomials of the Z's, right? So they were defined up to some global factor here. So the sum of all these probabilities normalized in such a way that they would be polynomials of the Z's is actually the isergin korepin determinant that I showed you in the first slide. So here is, a, here is really a, a remarkable connection because now I have all these parameters. You see, these are the inhomogeneous probabilities popping out here. So I have this complicated model with probabilities that depend on position and uh, whose normalization is given by this uh, six vertex model with domain one boundary condition uh, partition function with also 2n, so there are 2n uh, points here, and here there were n horizontal and n vertical um, spectral parameters. But this holds for this problem at q cubed equals 1, q cu cubic root of unity, in which case you see there is a symmetry between all the z's. That is, the horizontal and vertical parameters play symmetric roles, just at this uh, particular point. Okay. So the proof of this is kind of uh, uh, simple. Once you have understood how to use this QKZ equation to actually solve for those probabilities, and then uh, there are uh, two arguments, one with recursion and one with symmetry, uh, which uh, together uh, characterize completely the right-hand side to be uh, the uh, isergin korepin determinant. Okay, so that's one part of the story. Question is now, where are the TSS-CPP okay, in this picture? So right now, they are not yet there. But we have been introducing uh, uh, another physical model, which was this dense loop model, okay, in which certain probabilities turn out to be related to these alternating sign matrices. Okay? So how to relate that to TSS-CPPs? So here is what you can do. There is a more, generic, more general uh, knizhnik zamalchikov equation, which is... Uh, quantum Knizhi-Zamalchikov equation, in which uh, you're not using the temporally-lib algebra in which you don't care about loops, but you're using a temporally-lib algebra in which you care about loops, and you have a weight, small q, which actually corresponds to oriented loops. So if you sum over the two orientations, you have something like q plus q inverse as a weight per loop. So imagine now that instead of having this relation, I just have minus q plus q inverse times the i here, which means that this loop is erased, but now I keep track of it. That is, I keep a weight, a certain weight, for this loop. Okay? So there's a q now, which is no longer a cubic root of unity, because when it was a cubic root of unity, it would give 1 here. Okay? Same equations, which is that the transposition of two, of two parameters, zi and zi plus 1 in psi, is induced by the action of the R matrix. The R matrix is the same, but with this new representation of a temporary lib algebra, so it's slightly different, but not much. And now you have to write down also a cyclicity condition. Before we had this cylinder, which was invariant under rotations, and now it's a bit more complicated. When you rotate, you actually acquire phase factors. That's how these uh, quantum knizhnik zamalchikov equations are defined in, with this more generic uh, parameter Q. Okay, but the important thing is that we've done all the work already. The solution I presented is the same. So basically, the psi pi zero is the same, but now with a Q uh, which is uh, generic and no longer a cubic root of unity. 
And all the other sides are determined triangularly, so there is no more work to do. It's already done. Okay? But what happens now is that I have a, a set of objects. I want still to call them probabilities, but they are not really related to a dense loop model anymore. But what happens is that this Q deformation of those probabilities, if you want, is not the Q deformation provided by the six vertex model. So we are ending up somewhere else. And where are we ending up? We are ending up in TSS CPPs. That's the point. <laughs> so <clears throat> how does it work? I recall that the TSS CPPs had to be enumerated by just enumerating uh, non-intersecting lattice paths. Okay, in this one twelfth uh, fundamental domain of the hexagon. Okay, now you can refine this enumeration by putting a weight per pink uh, tile here, right? So whenever you turn left in this picture, you put a weight tau. Okay, so you 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 create this way a, 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 a partition function TSS CPP of n and tau, which is just the sum over the configurations of tau to the number of pink tiles. Okay. So it's a, it's, it's a refined enumeration. And here is the theorem. If you, sp if you uh, specialize uh, these deformed probabilities to the values of z equal to 1, but keep tau generic, tau being minus q plus 1 over q, then this sum is equal to the, deformed TSS, the refined TSS CPP enumeration. So here we have uh, the missing link, if you want. The solutions of a QKZ equation are on one side connected to enumeration of alternating sign matrices with all these parameters zi, but q, a cubic root of unity. And on the other side, if I take all the zi to one, but q generic, no longer a cubic root of unity, I end up in another problem, which is this enumeration of TSS CPPs. Okay? So I think this is quite, uh, quite remarkable. But just one equation gives you a branching to two different, different problems here. Okay? So uh, we proved that with Paulzin Justin, uh, with the help of, of, of Seilberger, we had everything worked modulo a lemma, and Seilberger proved the lemma for us, so everything's fine, and uh, there is a theorem here. Okay, so I just want to show you that you can actually compute. <laughs> it's not just uh, hand waving. So uh, this is the case of size six. So you have a cylinder, right, with, with, with six, uh, Perimeter six, okay, and you have a semi-infinite cylinder of square lattice above that. So you have five probabilities, basically, corresponding to these five uh, uh, configurations. And you can actually compute them uh, as polynomials, so they are not well normalized because they're polynomials of these with factors Q and Q2 and Q minus two here, okay. And uh, you can look at what it gives when uh, Either the z's are equal to 1 and q stays generic. So this is this case. And if you take the sum of your entries here, you find this enumeration of a TSS CPP at, uh, of size 6 uh, for tau. Okay. Um, if you take this tau equal to 1, which would correspond to go back to the initial case of q, a cubic root of unity, you find 1, 2, 1, 1, 2 of total 7. These are the seven alternating sign matrices I was showing you in the beginning, which are uh, 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 whose enumeration is refined according to which link pattern they correspond to. Okay. Now, uh, there's a remark here, which is that if you take tau equals 2 in this formula, you still get some integers, okay? 1, 4, 4, 4, 10, okay? And these integers actually have also a meaning. And I come to my last... Uh, Last point here, this uh, cherry on the cake, if you want, which is the degree and multi-degree of a variety of matrices of vanishing square. Okay, so uh, if you set Q equals minus 1 corresponding to tau equals 2 in this uh, problem here, and actually if you're more careful than that and take a scaling limit in which Q tends to minus 1 at the same time as the Z stem to 1, but with some uh, parameters A and UI, okay, so dividing out by the, the relevant power of epsilon, uh, your vector of probabilities tends to a new vector depending on A and U's, which is again a polynomial, okay? And then you have uh, the following uh, remark that if you take the UI equal to zero, so basically you take all the Z's equal to one and take 
this q to minus 1, well, these size tend to integers, okay? And the integers are 1, 4, 4, 4, 10 in the case of size 3, okay? And 1, 4, 4, 10 was exactly what I got out of my quantum nijik zamolchikov equation uh, here, okay? So by some magic, uh, by solving this problem uh, uh, having to do with uh, loops, uh, we apparently also solved uh, a problem of uh, finding the degree of a certain variety. So just to show you that I'm not uh, cheating, okay, I wrote for you the, the Mathematica program, which actually computes the degree of this variety. So it's a variety of complex matrices, upper triangular, 2n by 2n. And in this case, n is 3, so it's 6 by 6. So here is my matrix, okay? 6 by 6 matrix, strictly upper triangular, and all these elements, these 15 elements, are just complex numbers, okay? You write down all the equations that have to be written down for the square to be zero. So each row here has to be zero, basically. Okay, so all these quadratic equations. And you let uh, patiently uh, your uh, favorite uh, program work out the number of solutions after intersecting with the right number of random hyperplanes. Okay, so I'm drawing at random hyperplanes in number num here, which is floor of n over 2, floor of n plus 1 over 2, because I know already that's the dimension of a variety, so co-dimension. So that's exactly the number of hyperplanes I have to intersect it with to get a finite number of results. And I just ask him to give me the length of the solution, that is the number of solutions. And that's 23. So this 23 is actually uh, 1 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 10. Huh? It's this 23. That's my claim. Okay. So why 23 is 23? Well, actually the variety of 6 by 6 matrices uh, whose square is 0 and who are upper triangular actually decomposes in two components, into irreducible components. So you can actually compute the degree of each irreducible component. There are five of them. They are indexed by actually five, as you might remark, is a Catalan number. Okay? So it means there's certainly a way of... Uh, of, of um, labeling these irreducible components with actually link patterns. Okay, the link patterns I didn't say are also enumerated by Catalan number. Uh -huh. So um, here is how it works. Uh, you have a matrix of square zero. Okay, so it has certainly Jordan blocks of either size one or size two. Okay, so you're just sort of peeling your matrix and, and saying whether uh, at, at, at a given stage in the peeling you're going to have a a Jordan block of size one or size two at hand, and it, it gives you a path, basically a dick path, and this dick path you translate into a into a link pattern. Okay, so for each uh, component of a variety, you have a link pattern, and uh, well, if you just count the number of solutions your program found out in each of those components, uh, you will have a degree of each component, and you find one four 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 ten. Okay, so clearly, um, at least in this example. Uh, the solution of my quantum Tijik Zamochikov equation has exactly given you the right degrees of this, uh, of this variety. So I recall what we are doing now is just taking uh, the Q generic and Z is going to 1, but I take a Q that gives me also something combinatorial in such a way that this quantity is equal to 2 now instead of 1 for alternating sign matrices, and this is what it gives me. So this ends up... Uh, yeah, we're close to the end, with a theorem. And the theorem is that, uh, well, this variety, okay, splits into irreducible components v pi, whose degrees are given by these uh, psi pi, which are these uh, uh, normalized probabilities, solutions of QKZ, and in these limits, A equals zero and UI equals zero, okay? Now, there is more than that, but that would take us uh, too, too far, I think. Uh, which is that if you keep track of, of the a's and the u's in your scaling limit, you end up not with numbers, not with integers, but with polynomials again. And these polynomials have an interpretation in the equivariant cohomology of those varieties uh, as being uh, what is called the multi-degree. Okay, so the multi-degree is a degree um, corresponding to a certain action on the matrix elements. So basically, it's conjugation with, uh, with a diagonal uh, of UIs and multiplication by a scalar A, meaning that you associate 
a, a sort of weight, okay, to each matrix element. And then whenever you have an equation, you have to add up the weights, just like you would add up for, for finding the degree, and uh, adding up uh, the contributions, you, you end up with a polynomial, and that polynomial is the multi-degree. So there are some axioms, if you want, that determine the multi-degree, and that end up with the same solution. So actually, to prove things, it's better to, to, to work out with all the parameters rather than just the integers. Okay, now a corollary here, which is interesting, is that the enumeration of TSS CPP with a weight 2 per pink tile, okay, gives you the degree, the total degree of those variety. Now, this enumeration, you remember, is just the sum over TSS CPP of tau to the number of pink tiles, right? So 2 to the number of pink tiles. So for each TSS CPP, you have 2 to the power number of pink ties, and you add up all those numbers, and you find this degree. So there is a conjecture, which is still a conjecture, that the TSS CPPs actually give you, provide you for free, a natural degeneration of a variety into intersections of objects of degree 1 and objects of degree 2, because uh, it's a sum of products of 2, right? So it's also a sum of products of 2 and 1s. And the intersection of objects of degree 1 and degree 2 is precisely gives you a degree, which is their product, which is products of the 1s and 2s. So there should be a natural uh, degeneration of a variety, which is indicated, which is mapped, if you want, by the TSS CPP. So that's something that's still to be understood. OK, so uh, now I want to conclude, maybe. So we have this triangle now, which is uh, complete. Huh? all those connections, which are uh, provided by the quantum knizhik zamochikov equation. And this quantum knizhik zamochikov equation is yet another way of writing integrability, right? We were just using this uh, Mikado move for the R matrix operator. And uh, so instead of writing commutation of transfer matrices, we wrote some local uh, relation, which allowed to uh, completely solve for those probabilities, etc. Okay. Now, uh, I just want to say one word about generalizations. So there are uh, other possible boundary conditions on the loop model, for instance. And actually, they will all correspond to uh, different quantum knizhik zamolchikov equations. So these quantum knizhik zamolchikov equations have been classified. And there is one, basically, per root system of Lie algebra, of classical Lie algebra. Okay, so that's quite a lot of them. And presumably, they all correspond to different boundary conditions. Okay? And from the point of view of a variety of matrices of vanishing squares, well, what will happen is that it's going to correspond to other groups. And those groups are going to be related to the Lie groups of which these are the root systems. Okay. Now, there's another direction in which you can generalize things, which is by changing group. Of course, I didn't tell you that the, there was an underlying SL2 quantum group uh, behind all this uh, in the form of this temporary lib algebra here, but now I'm telling you. And uh, you have more general uh, quantum groups, which underlie more general such models, for which you can basically work out the same kind of, uh, of structures. So let me just flash for you two uh, examples. So this is a different boundary condition. Instead of wrapping my uh, square lattice on a semi-infinite cylinder, I just write it down on a strip. Okay? So now I, have, I, I need a way to make the loops re-enter whenever they exit. Okay? So I force these little wiggles things up to infinity. Okay? So anything that starts on the bottom, again, has to end up on the bottom. Okay, that's the same uh, uh, kind of structure. So again, uh, these link patterns are, are, are labeled now by really by the by the link patterns along the la uh, in the upper half plane. Okay, and the, uh, the the things corresponding to the totally symmetric self-complementary partition, plane partitions are different. They are different objects, and they are called cyclically symmetric transpose complement plane partitions. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> But these are basically other tilings of the hexagon with different symmetries. Okay, you can see that the symmetry here is different from what we, we were working before. And they, they also involve guys with a little hole in the middle. Okay, so the whole story can be repeated. 
and including the, the algebraic geometry part uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, matrices of vanishing squares. Now these matrices have to be in a Borel subgroup of the corresponding Lie algebra, and actually the Lie algebra is of B type for this type of boundary conditions. Okay, so you see there's a, a whole uh, a structure which goes along and which is coded by uh, a Lie algebra. Okay, now you have uh, a little bit like with uh, conformal field theories, by the way. So here we have uh, another direction in which we change group. Okay, so here is uh, the so-called Brouwer model, in which instead of just having two configurations with probability p and one minus p, I have three possible configurations in which I also can cross my two uh, my two links. Okay, so this gives rise, you see, to uh, to crossing uh, patterns. Okay. So instead of having the temporally lib algebra here, we have another algebra, which is called the Brouwer algebra. Okay? And actually, the, the geometry behind this has to do with the degree and multi-degree of the so-called commuting variety. So it's the variety of pairs of matrices that commute with each other. Okay? So again, uh, there is a whole uh, interesting story behind this statistical lattice model and the probabilities of connections, uh, crossing connections now. Uh, between boundary points and uh, this uh, degree of a commuting variety. I think this is the end. No? Okay. Higher rank. So this is when I replace my underlying SL2 quantum group by an SLK quantum group, in which case uh, everything generalizes. So on one side, I get now matrices whose k power is zero. Okay. So this is the multi degree of that variety. The temporally lib algebra is replaced by higher rank quotients of a Hecker algebra that corresponds to the quantum group uh, uh, UQSLK. Okay. And uh, there is also some generalized alternating sign matrix numbers uh, that you can derive. So there, there's a whole, uh, if you want, all, all I showed you was the tip of an iceberg. And basically, you have a whole uh, picture which can unravel uh, from there, and which I think is quite interesting because it's connecting problems which are of a different nature with different geometry. Some geometry is infinite, some is finite, and also uh, different areas of mathematics. So uh, it's kind of a nice uh, uh, central point, and I think I'm done. So thank you. Yeah, so these, uh, you see, the fact that the R matrix can be built out of a temporally lib algebra here is actually a, a, a manifestation of this fact, okay? So uh, more generally, uh, they will be constructed out of higher rank quotients of the Hecker algebra. So the Hecker algebra is like the big algebra which contains them all. And the commutant of a given quantum group uh, acting on a fundamental representation of this algebra will be given by one of those, uh, those algebras. So these are really quotient of the Hecke algebra. Bon. Yes? Okay, not... Uh, all right, so there are some people who are trying to actually extend the Razumov-Strogonov conjecture to the eight vertex model, okay? And actually, it's Razumov. I think I heard Razumov, so the same guys uh, that did these uh, first conjectures, who found some combinatorial structure hidden in the eight vertex model. So the answer is, yes, maybe, there is some extension which also involves the eight vertex model, but, um, okay, that might be much more delicate and complicated, but certainly it's in the same uh, uh, set of models. Uh, the, the eight vertex is, is like the, the, the one model above the six vertex, which is still solvable and still uh, uh, integrable, but now involves elliptic weights, okay, as opposed to uh, rational or trigonometric weights like, uh, like it does in the six vertex. So you have to understand how elliptic uh, objects work. So you're no longer working with rational functions, but with theta functions, basically. Huh? So, but perhaps, yeah, parts of this story can be reproduced again. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, I'm still here for two days, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate. <laughs> Thank you.